Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And needless to say, I'm very honored to be here. And I'm looking forward to haranguing you about my favorite uh, topics. Uh, before I really start, I'd like to make a disclaimer. I have made a rudimentary PowerPoint, but I hate PowerPoint. And even though it is looming over me, you will see that my heart was not in it. Uh, <laughs> The culture I will be talking about today uh, was an oral and auditory one. I hope you'll listen to the lecture in that spirit. And now I am going to begin by, if I can make the PowerPoint work. Yes, OK. Um, by adding two subtitles to my title. One of these is about the lecture, and one of them is about me, but they are interrelated. The two are The Secret Lives of Texts, and Confessions of an Unrepentant Philologist. The latter could almost qualify as controversial in this academic climate, and I thought it best to suppress it until now. For what I do, and what I spent my life doing, is deeply unfashionable, and in fact considered to be at best retrograde, and at worst a method and a pursuit that associates the pursuer with all the evil isms that enlightened scholarship now rejects the dead white male hegemonic colonialist orientalist discourse that we have all turned our backs on. I am a proud uh, practitioner of the black art of philology. And look at me, I look pretty harmless, right? But if philology is evil, I am the art fiend. Okay, now it is my self-imposed ta task today to try to convince you that this art can be used for white magic as well as bla black, and it is this art that allows us to access the secret lives of texts and the women who lurk between their lines. But first, what does a philologist do? I generally define it as text and context. For time periods in which the primary and often the only evidence available is textual, we focus on these texts but interpret them in as wide a context as possible and with as many tools as we can muster, starting with language, the state of text, its grammar, the meaning of its words, etc., but encompassing literary techniques and devices, religion, social and political context, and history. In other words, we try to put flesh on the bones of the text and the tricky thing is that often the only source for this flesh is the text itself or other text, a kind of reverse cannibalization. This brings me to my first subtitle, The Secret Lives of Texts. It is my belief that our philological impulse goes back to earliest childhood. The sense that children have, or I at least had, that characters in books have a full reality that is only partly glimpsed in, in the lines written about them. My childhood fantasy that Joe March and Little Woman, Women or Dorothy and Toto in The Wizard of Oz might join me in my own life and we could have further adventures not covered by the book. That later on in my life, Elizabeth Bennet in Pride and Prejudice had said many further wise and witty things uh, that happened not to have made it into print. Uh, this was before the ghastly attempts to do just that by modern authors who simply show thereby that they have not penetrated Elizabeth Bennet's or Jane Austen's secret life. That they all had a life after the book ended and before it began, a secret life, because it's unobservable to the readers. What is known in this part of the country as the backstory. This also leads to our annoyance when an author presumes to manipulate a character in ways that run counter to our sense of their reality. Why did Tolstoy make the vibrant Natasha into a dreary housewife at the end of War and Peace? How dare the detective story writer Elizabeth George kill off the appealing and inoffensive Helen for no good reason? We feel, I think, that though authors create their characters, they don't own them. Fiction isn't slavery. And we become indignant when authors presume to be behave arbitrarily to their creations. So, in what way is this belief in the reality of fiction philological? We who work on ancient or medieval texts take them as two-dimensional pieces of evidence for a three-dimensional, fully real and realized world. And our job is to use the scant evidence to project these dimensions, three dimensions out of two, 
or to use my original formulation, to read between the lines. But before I embark on any specifics of this reading, let me tell you a little bit about myself and what I work on. I was trained as a historical linguist and Indo-Europeanist, but my primary focus for a long time has been ancient India, as well as ancient Iran, mostly late second millennium and, and first millennium BCE, but occasionally breaching the year zero and moving into early first millennium CE. The languages I work with are Sanskrit, especially the most ancient form of it, known as Vedic Sanskrit, and to a lesser extent, texts in ancient and medieval languages descended from Sanskrit, as well as on the ancient Iranian languages of Vestan and Old Persian. For much of my career, I focus circling away and back again on the oldest Sanskrit text, the Rig Veda. Uh, the Rig Veda is a collection of over a thousand praise hymns to various divinities composed by a range of poets to accompany a very complex ritual system. It was composed probably between 1500 and 1200 BCE, though it is almost impossible to affix dates to texts in ancient India. There are about 10,000 verses, all told, and using the Western metric that used to prevail in my field, the text is about the length of the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. And they are really hard verses. For these hymns are not the simple outpourings of naive and ingenuous poets at the dawn of their culture, but sophisticated, artful, self-consciously poetic compositions belonging to a highly developed oral tradition inherited from their Indo-Iranian and Indo-European predecessors, but constantly reshaped by the contemporary poets to achieve the newest and most recondite expression of the age-old messages they were hired to convey. The poets push the boundaries of language itself to show off their dazzling virtuosity and to please the gods who are being praised because, as is often said, the gods love the obscure. So in my almost 50 years of working often on this text, I and my predecessors and fellow travelers have had to confront not merely the usual problems that bedevil anyone working on an ancient and incompletely understood language, but also the fact that the composers of the text don't want to make it easy for us or for their own audiences, either human or divine. For a lot philologists, this adds up to sheer bliss. We are passionate about details of the most arcane variety and especially details that on the first infection don't seem to make any sense at all. Since of the 10,000 verses of, in the Rig Veda, approximately 9,999 of them are utterly baffle, baffling at first glance, there is ample room to pursue delight. What does this all have to do with the women in my title who have so far been scanted in the discussion? <clears throat> Today I want to focus my attention on looking for women in the impenetrable forest of the Rig Veda, made all the more impenetrable by the fact that this text uh, and all the others associated with it were produced by elite males, for elite males, and are primarily concerned with ritual performance, warfare, and, and the attempt to get as many goods of this world as one can grab in war or other arenas in which elite males can compete. Where is this, there room for, for women in this type of text, and how can we even start to look for them? This involves adding another secret to one of my subtitles, now to be reformulated as the secret, secret lives of text. And it also involves a defiant return to my other subtitle, Confessions of an Unrepentant Philologist. Uh, the point here is that uh, in recent years, as academic disciplines have turned to uh, probing the margins, to, look, to looking for uh, uh, social groups, women and minorities uh, in text uh, in, uh, and daily life uh, in ways that are different from traditional historiography, those of us who do philology have bit, begun to feel somewhat beleaguered. We have been told that our discipline is unfit to take part in this new enterprise. Not only are we still complicit in the colonialist and orientalist attitudes and activities of yore, but our texts privilege the dominant paradigm, reflect only the elite, and cannot be used to probe the margins. 
the very fact that something has been written down and preserved uh, and has survived for m hundreds of years disqualifies it as evidence for what, in my corner of the larger discipline, is called somewhat bizarrely the subaltern. For example, I was told many decades ago that by some feminist scholars that it is impossible to do scholarship on women using only texts. I will not add another volley to these natural intramural academic disputes. I'll simply suggest that we, the philologists, can not only take on these questions, but we can actually investigate them better. We have the tools, the methodology, and the experience to probe the secret lives of texts and to use those same interest instruments on the secret, secret lives. Uh, and so I will hope to show this in what follows. Let me fa now finally turn to details. If I'm a philologist, that's what I should be doing. And I'm going to give you uh, a, a nice example of the sort of bafflement the Rig Vedic specializes in a piece of direct speech that closes an otherwise fairly conventional praise hymn dedicated to the great warrior god, Indra. Keep your eyes to yourself. Look below, not above. Bring your two little feet together. Don't let them see your two little lips. For you, a Brahmin priest, have turned into a woman. Okay, I cannot emphasize enough to you how unprecedented and out of place and utterly bizarre this verse is in the entire 10,000 verse text, which makes the question of what it's doing there all the more acute. What is this about? This little snatch of Arnold Schwarzenegger girly men discourse. I can tell you that the context provides us with no information about either the putative speaker or the addressee, besides the fact that the latter is identified as a Brahmin, that is, a male priestly figure and a member of the most exalted class. The tone of the passage appears to be both calculatedly insulting and mockingly, derisively belittling. I don't think cons cultural constructions of gender have changed so much over the last 3,000 years or so that our instinctive response to this little snatch of speech should be discounted. I can also tell you that two of the words have a particular suffix that is both colloquial and characteristic of women's speech. The two words are two little feet, hence my, the little in my translation, and what I've translated as two little lips, mostly out of despair. It's a hopox, that is a word that occurs only once in the whole multi-millennial history of Sanskrit. It's dual in grammatical number, that is, it expresses that there are two of the things referred to. It has no obvious etymology, and judging from context, it seems likely to be semi-obscene. So some part of the female genitalia seems plausible. I'd like to be explicit about what enabled me to come to these conclusions. It's simply old-fashioned, unfashionable philology. In this case, a detailed sensitivity to grammar, that is, to t technical grammatical categories and how they're deployed, and to the sociolinguistic context, to linguistic register, the highness or lowness of a word or a grammatical construction, the company that a word keeps in an, in an ancient language, and who is likely to use it. These are the kinds of niggling details that people like me pay attention to, and taken one by one, they may seem trivial, but the accumulation of these details allows us to build, I hope, a solid edifice. Putting together all these slender pieces of evidence from the verse, we can conclude, or probably conjecture is a more honest verb, that the first three quarters of the verse, consisting of commands, keep your, feet to yourself, keep, keep your eyes to yourself, look below, not above, bring your two little feet closer together, don't th let them see your two little whatever they are, uh, are being presented to us as women's speech, so marked both by the form, the characteristic diminutive woman suffix, and by the context, which sounds like a mother instructing her young daughter in proper decorous female behavior. And this little imitation of maternal advice, which is wildly out of place in a text consisting of solemn, high-style hymns praising the great divinities, and in fact in a hymn praising the most hyper-masculine and powerful of all the gods, is then followed by the devastating insult, for you, a Brahmin, have turned into a woman. 
The speaker insinuates that the addressee, a Brahmin male, is in need of instruction in the demure ways of little girls, the instruction just given. Because he has lost his title to maleness, his right to behave like a man. But even if I'm right about the interpretation of the passage, which is certainly open to question, what is this all about? We have managed the first stage of philological inquiry, the always challenging task of simply figuring out what the words are and what they're trying to tell us. But why are they telling us this, and why here, and why now? Almost all of this hymn is a normal praise of the god Indra. He's invincible, he's generous, and everything related to him is absolutely superlative. And then it ends abruptly like this, a gratuitous gender-bending taunt directed at an unidentified priestly man with the god nowhere in evidence. What's going on? That's our next step. There are a few things we can exclude. Uh, I very much doubt that this passage anticipates present-day transgender surgery. The ta taunting accu accusation does not call attention to a physical reality, but to a metaphorical and emotive transformation. And some things never change, and therefore to us short-sighted moderns seem perpetually modern. And one of these eternal verities is the motivation for insults like, you have become a woman. <clears throat> Why did Arnold Schwarzenegger call the California state legislators girly men in July 2004? Not because they were yielding to his masculine posturing, but thwarting his budget. In another country and another uh, era, why was John Stuart Mill, uh, again, not, not the first person you think of in conjunction with Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, the 19th century English philosopher and public intellectual accused of being, quote, feminine and depicted dressed as a woman, in great part because he wrote so eloquently and influentially about the rights of women. The point being, I assume, that if you're perceived as having too much sympathy for women, you are perilously close to becoming one yourself. So here we have two reasons for calling a man's masculinity into question. First, holding opposition views on matters of policy, and second, championing women. And I would argue, and have indeed argued, that both of these are involved in the de devastating finale of our passage, you have become a woman. Let me explain. I consider this brief passage a piece of flotsam in an ongoing debate about the place of women in Vedic ritual, in sacrifice, which is the constant preoccupation of the Rig Veda and the occasion for the composition of all its contents. I also think that the debate was carried out beneath the surface of texts that seemed to be about something else entirely, in a number of the later hymns of the Rig Veda. This is the secret of their secret lives, the hidden political or social message that masquerades as a different discourse entirely, whose verbal disguise we must learn to recognize and interpret, just as easily and automatically, I hope, see behind the political discourse of our own time, the dog whistles and the code words. But before looking for glimpses of other such pieces of flotsam in the Rig Veda, I have to give you a little more background, I'm sorry. There is a vast body of ritual texts that more or less immediately follow the Rig Veda, our earliest Sanskrit text, chronicling one of the most fantastically detailed and faithfully recorded ritual systems the world has ever known. Thousands of pages specifying every offering, every hand gesture, every footstep of the multiple participants in, in these great ritual spectacles. And one of the standard and required participants in all these rituals is a woman the so-called sacrificer's wife. To mount a sacrifice, you, that is, the male, have to be married, and your wife has to be there and perform her prescribed duties. Mostly sitting around, but occasionally being led somewhere to do something, usually must mundane, like gazing at the melted butter offering, but sometimes decidedly icky, like having sex with a just strangled horse. True, true, it's there. Uh, <clears throat> I devoted a large part of my 1996 book, Sacrificed Wife and Sacrificer's Wife, to an investigation of this role through the large corpus of Vedic ritual texts. 
The sacrifice wife is just there in the ritual text. She occasions no special notice, any more than this type of priest or that one. And when I was studying her role, it never occurred to me that it had not always existed. Thus buying into what religions always want us, want us to buy into, it has always been this way. I assumed, and worse than that, unconsciously assumed, a presupposition that I'm rather embarrassed uh, about, that Vedic ritual from the beginning, whatever that means, had always had a slot for the sacrificer's wife. But in fact, there is only one amb unambiguous mention of this role in the Rig Veda, and that in a part of the text that is somewhat aberrant. It's also absent from the very closely related old Iranian text. Which suggests that the Rig Vedic, that, that the wife's participation in the middle Vedic text is a ritual innovation, however much it masquerades as business as usual. And we all know from reading Anthony Trollope, if nothing else, innovation does not come easily to religious institutions. On the personal level, there are entrenched conservatives who stand to lose power or influence if the system changes. And of course, there is an understandable fear that changing the system will cause it to lose its efficacy, its power to mediate successfully between the human and the divine, since God seem even more conservative than church elders. And how much more magnified would the, would the resistance and the fears be when the innovation in question involved in introducing the messy, unpredictable, and often contrary world of women into the pure, ordered domain of ritual performance. It is hard to believe that this happened without a struggle, despite the placid surface of the later ritual texts. The str struggle must have come earlier, and the forces of change prevailed before the ritual manuals of the later period uh, uh, that we have. I would argue that the issue was being bitterly fought in the late Rig Veda, and we see the skirmishes shaping a number of hymns that present sharply opposing depictions of female figures. The motivations and meanings of these hymns have been variously interpreted by ancient and, and indigenous commentators, as well as modern and western ones. But these hymns are ordinarily examined singly and independently, rather than as a body of poems that, in my view, collectively limb the dimensions of a theological debate, though, on it, as it were, on deep background. In what follows, I will sketch a few of the more memorable hymns and the female figures that populate them, and suggest what they contribute to the deep background debate. I think we can count the poet of the you have become a woman verse as a particularly sour member of the anti-faction against the introduction of women into the ritual and even more against the men who are for it. Let us now examine a hymn that I would reckon on the pro side, the side in favor of introducing women. This is a hymn de depicting a delightful married couple, Mudgala and Mudgalani, who run an unorthodox kind of chariot race, using defective and makeshift equipment and with the wife, Mudgalani, as charioteer. As you can no doubt imagine, charioteer was a male role, so just to start with, Mudgalani's presence is anomalous. Before examining some of the bizarre details of this hymn, let me uh, first explain what the sacrificer's wife is considered to contribute in the later ritual system. The later texts that discuss this ritual system make it quite clear time after time that the woman is, in it, woman is there to infuse the proceedings with fertility, to make the ritual performed an instrument for producing not only children, that is sons, but also an increase in the sacrificers' herds and flocks, and even an, an explosion of material goods. The trade-off must have been that this feminine fertility serving as a model for increase of all sorts, was worth the price of an introducing the disruptive feminine into the ordered masculine realm of ritual. The Mudgalani hymn makes this abundantly clear. In the first sight we catch of her in the second verse of the hymn, she is standing on the chariot with her clothing suggestively askew. In the same sentence she is presented both in this implicitly sexual way and as a winning charioteer. The wind kept lifting up her garment when she won a thousand cattle and a chariot in addition. The chariot she is driving is pulled by a unique team, a hyper-virile bull, and a block of wood. 
<laughs> the bowl seems to be standing in for the god Indra, the block of wood for Mudgalani's husband, and there's hardly a more obvious symbol for impotence than this block of wood. The married couple, when we first encounter them, seem to be infertile and childless. As the race proceeds, we encounter a startling, even shocking image. The bull was yoked for making kaka, in other words, defecation. Its long-haired charioteer dodged and dodged, but the droppings of the frenzied bull, yoked and running with the cart, kept hitting Mudgalani. This image of literal bullshit striking the woman charioteer standing on the chariot box behind him as they career along the race course suggests, while subverting, sexual contact between the bull, who, remember, is standing in for the great god Indra, and the woman, while the husband, literally a blockhead, is yoked right beside the bull that is symbolically having sex with his wife. But not too long after, the wooden block is celebrated for contributing to the victory, the winning of a thousand cows, and it is even say, said that he is, quote, made to mount, something unspecified, but mount is, of course, sexually suggestive, and one possible object is the wife. And the narrative, if we can dignify these tantalizing scraps with that term, is summed up at the end of the hymn in this way. She has accomplished the recovery of her husband like a once avoided wife. She swelling, he dripping, as if working with a poor water wheel. The swelling and dripping are signs of burgeoning fertility. She swells with milk, he drips, well, um, I'll let you decode that one yourself. The avoided wife is a stock figure in later Vedic ritual, avoided because she is infertile. But Mudgalani has redeemed herself from that role, has cured the impotence of her wife, husband with her bold piloting of the chariot with its ill-assorted team, leading to a re resounding victory. The hymn is hard enough to decode as it is. I have spared you the recital of the days and months of hard philological labor required to get even to this surface understanding. But as I intimated previously, I'm now going to claim that this odd story is putting forth an argument in the abstruse theological debate about ritual innovation, the introduction into ritual of the figure of the sacrificer's wife. I realize that this may be a hard sell. There is no direct mention of ritual, much less the sacrificer's wife. The hymn is just about a race, at least on the surface. But you should first know that the metaphor of the chariot as standing for ritual is an extremely common one throughout the Rig Veda. And with that in mind, the wife Mudgalani as charioteer can be interpreted as standing for the sacrificer's wife and directing the whole ritual show. The hymn can be read as an extended metaphorical treatment of the new ritual model, a piece of theological propaganda or an ad campaign. The emphasis throughout the hymn on the unorthodox and makeshift nature of the equipment and the surprising outcome in victory signal that the ritual partnership between husband and wife is a new untried model which nonetheless brings even more success than the old one. The message is, don't left, get left behind. Try the new and improved sacrifice with scientifically proven wife injection. Once you experience the results, more gold, more horses, more cows, more sons, you'll never go back to the pokey old ways. The mechanism for how this would work in the ritual is enacted symbolically in the hymn. In the ritual, the wife will have contact with the gods, with the divine, and will serve as a conduit of their power, which will enhance her fertility and that of the human sphere in general. In the hymn, Mudgalani has quasi-sexual contact with the great god Indra, as mediated through the bowl and his droppings, and the god's power passes through her and reinvigorates her husband, cures his impotence, and enhances his vitality. Thus the case on the pro side. On the anti side of this debate, we have the famous, or famous in certain circles, uh, dialogue of Yama, the first man, more or less, the parentage is a little confused, and his twin sister, Yummy, which is surely the most delicious name a would-be seductress ever received. She badgers her brother to have sex with, him, with her so they can populate the world. He, prudish and moralistic, not to mention a little scared, reminds her that the gods are always watching. 
He prevails, or rather, she doesn't. It's an impasse, and she ends by exclaiming something that must be close to, you jerk, you really are a jerk, Yuma. If only we had a handle on this piece of slang found only here in all of Sanskrit. The sex doesn't happen, or not then, leaving us to wonder how, how the rest of us humans got here after all. The range of interpretations of this enigmatic dialogue probably tell us more about the psychosexual attitudes of the interpreters than we really wish to know, but I'll add my own. One of Yummy's arguments for having incestuous sex is that the creator made us a married couple in the womb, referring to their twinnedness. The word for married couple is used elsewhere of the ritual pair of the sacrificer and sacrificer's wife. By putting it into the mouth of the sexually importunate yummy, the poet seems to be saying that allowing a married couple, an equal and balanced pair, to participate in sacrifice would open the floodgates to the voracious sexuality of the female, which pays no heed to the universal moral order, and we men must resist. Indeed, in the hymn itself, we can see Yummy's reasoned arguments for their coupling, in which she claims even the gods want that outcome, give way to expressions of naked, ungoverned desire, expressed not only in words, but by formal devices, like disturbance in the poetic meter and the truncation of the poetic line. She says, desire for yama has come to me, yummy, to lie together in the same place. Like a wife to her husband, I would yield my body. Driven by desire, many times I murmur this, mingle your body with my body. Yama's cool rejection of her increasingly uncontrolled demands seems the voice of collective male reason, though in literary terms she comes off as the more compelling character. The message, it's too risky to try this new model and insert the wife into the sacrifice. She may start out seeming sensible and logical, but soon her ungovernable appetites take over. Another famous dialogue, uh, is uh, between a pious seer, Augusta, and his wife, Lopa Mudra. It's somewhat more equivocal. The dialogue begins with Lopa Mudra urging her husband to cease his nonstop religious labors and have sex with her before it's too late. She says, for many autumns have I been laboring, evening and morning through the aging dawns. Old age diminishes the beauty of bodies. Bullish men should now come to their wives. Like Yummy in her reasonable phrase, she then cites historical precedent, in this case the fact that even the pious ancients knocked off work from time to time in favor of conjugal activities. Augusta responds with a call for renewed religious effort, but in the very next verse, it's pretty clear that he succumbed to his own desire. Uh, this next quotation comes with a trigger warning. It's pretty explicit. The lust of a mounting bull, which is a, uh, a pun on waxing reed, which is a metaphor for penis. The lust of a mounting bull has come to me. Lust arisen, arisen from here, from there, from everywhere. Lopa Mudra makes the bullish one flow out. The flighty woman sucks the steadfast man when he is snorting. Are we to take this as a salvo from the anti side or from the pro faction? The text does not make it easy to decide. The next verse after Augusta's sexual capitulation contains a purificatory penance for bad behavior, but the one after that suggests that he got everything he wanted, both offspring and ascetic power, so his surrender seems to have had a good outcome. I'll close with a hymn that also attempts a middle way, uh, seeming to recognize the anxieties of the conservatives about the new model and seeking to provide reassurance a hymn somewhat, sometimes rather histrionically titled The Rape and Return of the Brahmin's Wife in Western translation, though there's no hit, hint of rape. The history of its exegesis is a cautionary lesson in what can happen when the most sober philologists and who were more sober than the 19th century Germans let their fancies wander, a history I will not relate here. This short seven verse hymn begins by mentioning an offense against a Brahmin Remember that Brahmins are religious personnel who belong to the most exalted class. This offense is proclaimed by various cosmic forces at the beginning, but the last verse of the hymn pronounces the offense expiated. An inner ring of verses declares that a whole slew of gods have, quote, given back the Brahmin's wife, leading us to believe that taking her away had something to do with the mentioned offense. 
But the middle three verses talk about the power of the Brahmin's wife and the difficult feats she accomplishes, feats recognized by the very ancient gods and seers themselves. This peculiar little text finds a perfect niche in the debate I've suggested is roiling the Vedic theological waters at this time. The hymn admits that the entry of the wife into the ritual is something of an offense, but an expiatable one. The offense is first against a Brahmin, presumably her husband, separating him from his wife and placing her in the ritual arena. And her position there is also quite perilous. She interacts with the gods and acts as conduits of the fearsome forces unleashed by the sacrifice. Her contact with the gods is also potentially adulterous. Remember that the primary function of the wife in ritual is to inject sexuality and fertility into it and to enhance these qualities in order to tap their energy in the mundane world. So when she enters the ritual arena, she becomes a potential surrogate wife for the gods assembled there. And given the power of the gods, there's also the danger that they will not want to release her at the end of the ritual. But these po possible dangers did not arise. The inner arena of the hymn emphatically states that the gods have given her back without rancor, and the offense is expiated in the final verse. The middle verses of the hymn explain why courting all this danger was worth the risk, chronicling the wife's activities on the ritual ground and their importance. It is she who, quote, places what is difficult to place in the highest distant heaven, which I take as her, a reference to her role in mediating between the earthly and divine realms and conveying the oblations offered on earth to heaven where the gods reside. Because she performs this action, the gods themselves and the primordial seers proclaim her to be fearsome, and her activity, quote, protects the kingship of the ruler himself. Thus, according to this view, the, participants, uh, the, the participation of the wife in the ritual brings the highest benefits, and some actions can only be done by her or only be done with the highest efficacy. A cost-benefit analysis has been performed, and the result is strongly in favor of the new ritual model, at least according to this hymn. The views of this poet and theologians like him won the day, and the unquestioned pr uh, presence of the sacrificer's wife uh, in the next period of Vedic literature is the result. I have briefly introduced you to a series of enigmatic fragments of stories about women in the late Rig Veda. And I have further argued that their enigmas lie not only in the pu often puzzling details of the story, but also why the story is being told in the first place. I have made the very bold claim that each one is ammunition in a seething dispute between elite religious figures, between a conservative faction trying to keep women out of ritual practice and a progressive one attempting to harness the perceived power of women for religious ends. So why is the theological debate played out in these enigmatic narratives? Well, first of all, we have no reason to believe that it was only treated here. No doubt the factions discuss these issues directly, whether heatedly or dispassionately, those these discussions were not preserved in the textual record. But surely one of the important things for each side was to mobilize support. Not popular support, of course. This was probably more like one of those opaque power struggles in the Vatican that spill out into the press from time to time than an inclusive societal debate. But we also know how powerful narratives are in political discourse, including or especially abbreviated narratives that feature emblematic figures and incidents. The welfare queen versus the single mom struggling to provide for her children. The illegal immigrant rapist versus the family seeking asylum from unceasing violence in their home country. These dueling figures not real humans, but constructed symbols, mobilize emotion as well as opinion and are all the more potent for it. I suggest that Mudgalani and Lopamudra, Yami and the Brahmin's wife, served the same purpose in this slice of time in ancient Indian religious history. And we must endeavor not only to reconstruct their stories, but also the reasons these stories were deployed. In other words, in this particular lecture, I have attempted to show that we can use purely philological tools 
to identify, examine, and interpret disguised political discourse in antiquity or any time and place that is not our own. The particular use of words and grammatical constructions, the rhetorical inclusions and evasions, the shaping of narratives and hidden arguments. In our day, many commentators do just this with current political discourse as their object. Dissecting and interpreting the st statements of politicians is a thriving subfield in the press, and I think we are all grateful for it. An example I mentioned earlier is the identification of dog whistles and code words in political spe speech that are meant as signals to political subcultures but pass the ordinary listener by. There are terms for the sub-subfields of this industry. I grew up during the heyday of the so-called Kremlinologist, a person whose task it was to interpret the tiniest details of wording and physical protocol emanating from the seat of Soviet power in order to figure out who was in and who was out, what was going on inside the black box. The same now happens for, with North Korea. I would call this philology. And in fact, the Wikipedia discussion of the techniques of Kremlinology begins, quote, during the Cold War, lack of reliable information about the country forced Western analysts to read between the lines, note the phrase, and to use the tiniest tidbits to try to understand what was happening in internal Soviet politics. This is exactly what a philologist does, but working with the evidence from cultures long past and therefore working with materials in languages that we can only incompletely know, that with texts that are, are preserved only in incomplete or damaged form and without the context of other texts, and without all the other rich contextual information that enables our understanding of contemporary discourse, the back channels, the defectors reports, all of the rich visual evidence, the photo photos and the satellite images. It was famously said of Ginger Rogers that she did everything Fred Astaire did, but backwards in high heels. <laughs> and so do we, philologists. I therefore cl claim for me and for my ilk the proud title of Ginger Rogers philologist. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Jameson, thank you so very much for that wonderful lecture. Uh, we do have the time for some questions, and I believe there are some mobile um, microphones on the move. So if you want to raise a hand, and we will bring you a microphone. The sections you talked about were uh, kind of one subject area that was extremely interesting. Did you also find philosophical things like people keep debating where did the golden rule come from and other things in our culture that have passed down as axioms of life and things like that. Well, the Rig Veda has almost anything in it that you could want. There is a set of, of um, hymns which are often referred to as philosophical hymns, uh, although that's probably not, that's not a term that I would use. Uh, but which speculate on um, the origins of the cosmos and the functioning of the cosmos and so on. Um, it's a ritual culture, and so the questions of, say, moral, um, uh, moral things like the golden rule are not really something that we run across. But keep in mind that this is only the tiniest slice of what must have been the whole discourse of this period. We're really, really restricted by what the, what the texts that, we, that were prefer, preserved can tell us. Uh, I, 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 unfortunately, I can't, I can't tell you where the golden rule come, came from, but you know, maybe from India, I'm happy to believe that. One is, is there any uh, argument for um, bringing philology back beyond, as you say, ancient, partial, scattered texts, since so much of it seems a great deal like, uh, in some ways, your bete noir here, which is contemporary cultural criticism, seems very similar, um, except that 
cultural critics just look at the text, even though they have a plethora of other information and context. And then related to that, you also sort of scattered a few uh, dismissals of Orientalism. And uh, I thought maybe you might want to comment on the fact that Edward Said uh, begins his life as a student of philology and, and speaks in his autobiographical writing about his, his uh, admiration of classical philology. Um, yeah, okay, both of those, let me, um, I have to think back on, on, the first question is about bringing back philology. Well, I, you know, I hope, uh, standing here, uh, I am an, uh, an example of, it doesn't have to be brought back, it's still here. <laughs> uh, but I would say one of the points of my, my lecture today was to indicate that what we do as philologists, as philologists working with ancient texts, is really what's happening a good deal of the time when people examine political discourse. And uh, it's simply not given that title, but the same kinds of attention to the use of language uh, is what is, uh, you know, when we uh, read the, well, I read the newspaper and paper, but uh, when we read the press or listen to the press, much of it is interpreting uh, the language that is coming out of political speech. And it doesn't matter which side, I'm not at this point going to take sides, but simply that philology is with us all the time, it's just not, not called that. As for um, Orientalism, I didn't mean to sound as though I was um, uh, dismissing it. As a, the past president of the American Oriental Society and the, uh, the, the editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American Oriental Society, I, I would, uh, among other things, be uh, sort of disingenuous for me to disavow Orientalism. Uh, I, I think the word has unfortunately become um, a flashpoint uh, and for people who wish to dismiss uh, the study uh, that, that is associated with, say, 19th century Oriental discourse, uh, all of the, the, it has become simply um, a, a, a dog whistle in a certain way. Uh, Orientalism is, uh, in, embodies everything that we don't like about 19th century scholarship. I actually, um, feel as though a good deal of the time I live in the 19th century because I spend all of my time reading, uh, when I'm not reading ancient texts, I'm reading the people whose work I really, really admire, and those are the people who did all of the hard spade work to get us to be able to understand on the most, uh, you know, sort of just the, the simplest level, what these words were, what the texts were about, what the rituals were, uh, and the fact that from time to time they may have uttered a somewhat disparaging word about the text that they were working on uh, is uh, nothing to the amount of, of intellectual labor that they put into it. So I am actually a proud Orientalist. Um, and I uh, certainly would not uh, wish to, uh, I, mean, I would like to, to, um, to associate myself with the Edward Said of um, the earlier days. Do you mind elaborating a little bit on if it's the type of innovation when this ritual change happened? Was it more pristine innovation or demic diffusion? Like, was it cultures from other cultures influencing? India. Oh, you mean the, the introduction of the sacrificer's wife? Yes. I don't think so. Other cultures in influencing that period in India, it would be a black box because we have absolutely no evidence for it. But I see no reason not to see it as a sort of natural outgrowth of the way the ritual was uh, set up. What, what, do the, what were these rituals? Uh, performed for to produce fertility to get in increase and you know there's this, this you know this woman here and she actually does a lot with regard to fertility and so it makes a certain amount of sense to give her a place I also have a much longer argument about this, which I don't want to bore you with, which has to do with the disjoining of a of what used to be a a, a, a sort of continuous ritual uh, system from uh, domestic 
uh, rituals to very fancy uh, rituals of the type that you see in the Rig Veda. And when this, these two systems got disjoined for whatever reason, uh, there was no longer a place for the woman, for the wife, as there had been in the um, domestic rituals. And this actually uh, occasioned a, a hole in the ritual system that needed to be filled. So I personally think that it is uh, internally driven. Um, and, but, uh, and, and we have no other evidence that we could bring to bear for its not being internally uh, driven, which means that I win by default. <laughs> you're a philologist, you're looking at texts, and uh, you have this political interpretation about the role of women and the changing, changing of the ritual. I wondered, are there uh, non-textual uh, artifacts uh, Pictures, sculptures, uh, I mean, in our political discourse, pictures play a big role. Right, no, right? of course. There's nothing uh, else to use uh, for from this, that period. For this particular period, no. There's, uh, there's no reliable archeological evidence that you could associate with this culture. And uh, they were on the move, they were both transhuman and also you know, sort of infiltrating into uh, northern India and down further. So it, it was not in their interest, actually, to put um, their aesthetic sense into um, physical objects, which is why, I, in my personal opinion, they put it all into this elaborate poetry. E there are no, uh, even the ritual, which is, as I said, unbelievably elaborate, uh, can be done anywhere. There are no buildings, there are no temples. What you do is you take a reasonable piece of ground, which you identify, and then you sacralize it by, in various ways. And so you don't, you can, you know, if you're on the move with your herds, you can say, okay, it's time to do such and such a ritual. Um, that piece of ground isn't marshy, uh, it's facing in the right direction. We can sacralize it by saying words over it and demarking it with a wooden spade. And so we don't even need a building. So uh, it is, it's, it's peculiar in that regard because most ancient cultures also have other channels of information, uh, visual, archeological, and so on. We just don't for that, um, uh, which you know, in a certain way is good for me because you have to depend on me, but you know. Um, uh, it would be lovely if we had some other, th other amount of, of evidence, but uh, it's not that I, I um, that I have, you know, I, I dismiss or I'm not interested in other such evidence, there just isn't any. So you did comment on the, the, the role of goddesses in Rig Vedic hymns. Would you be able to say a few words about that, please? Yeah, uh, goddesses. There aren't as many as I would like, of course. Um, uh, the, the major goddess in Rig Veda is, um, the, is Dawn. Uh, Dawn is very beautiful. Um, and um, that's about it. No. <laughs> uh, 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 the, I mean, it's especially given the, the, the more, much more a uh, prominent role of goddesses in later Hinduism, the fact that there are so few is surprising. Um, there's a set of, of goddesses that are known collectively, they don't have any names or anything, uh, as um, the, the wives of the gods. And they get to come to the ritual, and in certain ways I think they are uh, the model, one of the models for the introduction of the human wife uh, is that they come along and they, you know, they're sort of led around too. But, uh, for example, Sarasvati, who becomes an unbelievably important goddess in later Hinduism, um, the, Sarasvati is just a river in the Rig Veda. There are a few, few hymns de dedicated to her, but all of the important features that have to do with learning and so on that are associated with her later, not there. She just, she flows, she's a river. Uh, and that's important, because rivers are important in ancient India. But uh, goddesses are just very, very, I feel like a margin, but uh, <laughs> are just not there in the same way that I would like. Um, so, sorry. I was wondering what the kind of mention of women in the later Vedas is 
Uh, can we read some kind of changes uh, with how women are represented in the later Vedas, like the Sama Veda or the Athar Veda or the Yajur Veda, or, um, uh, or the kind of, kind of the purpose of why those texts were written were different, right? Like some of these texts were more about performative rituals and the performative aspects of rituals, and do the mention of women there change? Uh, well, in the later Vedas, of course, we do have the sacrificer's wife, because uh, already by the Atarva Veda, which is our second oldest text, the sacrificer's wife is simply there. So this change happened between Rig Veda and Atarva Veda. But um, there's not a lot of material, just in certain ways, because the Rig Veda is a much richer text in terms of its um, uh, sort of the, the, the variety that it produces. In um, later Brahmana texts, for example, Shatapada Brahmana, and then especially the early Upanishads, we begin to get some interesting figures like Yajnavalkya's two wives, one of whom is interested in uh, learning and not just in inheriting her husband's wealth. But really, it's just, there's, there's very, it's, a, it's still an elite male, ritually dominated set of texts. This is not to say that there wasn't all sorts of wonderful stuff out there, but it didn't, didn't survive. And that, I think, I, I have been told is the last question. One more question, if there's one more question. The, the context is very important, as you point out. I'm wondering if this type of poetry was done when people were gathered smoking or drinking or partying or a wedding or some other kind of an affair that could add context to the meaning of this poetry? Well, the poetry was all um, composed for performance at rituals, uh, uh, primarily at the, the fanciest ritual, which was the Soma ritual. And so the poetry that we have in the Rig Veda is all ritually based. Um, the, 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 these hymns about women maybe not, although they're sort of secondarily, but the vast amount, vast uh, part of the Rig Veda is hymns that were composed to be per performed at rituals and were um, commissioned by the sacrificer himself, generally probably a king, whatever king meant in that period. And so what it is, it's occasional poetry and it's poetry for hire in a sense, um, but a very su superior, superior kind of hireling. The, basically, the poet was, as it were, the, um, the he, he produced the, the verbal material that go, uh, accompanies the, the ritual material, praises the gods and gets the gods to give us stuff which is really the point of all of this. So the context is very clear, it's just um, not, you know, you have to understand the ritual in order to understand the poetry, but it's, it's not a very broad kind of context, um, I'm afraid. My, I, I, I told you about the really fun hymns of the Rig Veda. I could have spent uh, 45 minutes telling you about um, uh, sort of like uh, how we take the, the, the um, fire to be offered into out of the other fire and carry it to the east. We could have done that for, you know, 45 minutes. We could have done um, the 114 Soma hymns in the Soma Mandala, which is about how you take this little piece of, of plant and you press it and, the, and pour the juice through uh, across a, um, uh, a sheep's wool. Um, there are 114 hymns that contain, that treat only that. So uh, you should be really uh, grateful to my rather uh, restraint uh, and my attempt to, you know, do a crowd pleasing uh, sort of uh, se selection from the Rig Veda rather than what I could have done. <laughs> so thank, thank you. Thank you so very much.